time to get back to something that I've been meaning to do since a bit back I reviewed Come Drink With Me, uh, an exploration of more of the films of King Who. I've reviewed martial arts films in the past, some Shaw Brothers films. However, King Who is a martial arts film director who's gotten in the Criterion Collection, which is one of those things where I go, okay, I should pay more attention here. So... This month, I'll be covering those two films that made it have been inducted into the Criterion Collection thus far, starting with the 1967 film, Dragon Inn. When I reviewed Come Drink With Me, I described it as a wuxia western, as the initial plot of the film, with Golden Swallow going to rescue her brother from bandits holed up in a monastery, could just as easily be the plot of a western. Again, swap out the monastery with a mission, um, and give the bandits guns instead of swords, and there you go. It is only through the introduction of Drunken Cat's plot that the wuxia elements come to the floor, with the sworn brotherhood of um, uh, Drunken Cat with the corrupt leader of the monastery who the who is the patron for the bandits. Dragon Inn, by comparison, maintains a better balance of the concepts, melting them together to make a cohesive whole, which still can borrows and, and is in dialogue with the cinematic language of Western movies, particularly the uh, films of John Ford, um, but also melding them together to make a cohesive, unique whole. The film is based around the titular Dragon Gate Inn, a stopover place for travelers headed through a mountain pass with the pass behind the inn and a big rocky floodplain in front. The Western part has to do with a bunch of ne'er-do-wells holding up Pulling up in the inn, waiting for some children and their protectors to come through to ambush as they flee to the west, so the baddies can ambush them. And just take them out. While the baddies wait, several fighters drift into the inn, get caught up in events, and end up helping out the family. Now, again, this would be on paper the plot for any basic wuxia, uh, basic Western movie. Where the wuxia get involved is that these children are those of General Yu, a general who was so honest, who was honest and forthright, but ended up on the wrong side of court eunuch Sao, and so Sao had you executed. And the ne'er-do-wells are with Sao's secret police, with the fighters being various swords people with varying degrees of ties to General Yu, and those ties being higher, much higher than any loyalty to the state. This change narratively helps merge the wuxia thematic elements with the Western frame and combine them, blend them with the Western framework for a much more different and unique end. The change of location also helps. King Hu, as of this point in his career, had relocated from Hong Kong and with Shaw Brothers to Taiwan and is working with the Union Film Company, which appears to be basically this state-run um, cinema uh, film studio. Hu takes full advantage of the new terrain at his disposal, literally making the environment as much of a character in this film as Monument Valley is for John Ford. It makes for visually a truly breathtaking film. The plot, with the corrupt Chinese central government and various parties banging together to help the family of someone who stood against the government escape to exile, also feels like a stronger fit in a way to Taiwan with Hong Kong. It's, you could argue that it's a whitewashing of the Kuomintang's fascist history in mainland China, in favor of the romanticizing of the flight of, of Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang to Taiwan, but I'll get into this a little bit further later. It doesn't quite do that because the people who are flying, fleeing to the West are not meant to be like true heirs to the state or anything like that. This isn't set during the Roaring States period, to the uh, Three Kingdoms period or anything like that, where these characters aren't given any ties to any of the factions of the, of the Three Kingdoms who ended up losing. There is no, like, these people aren't, or to put things in a Western context, this isn't like um, the various swashbucklers who would have uh, Scottish patriots um, being exiled because they sided with Bonnie Prince Charles, and at no point is, is like, Prince Charles Trump in return in any way related to the plot of the story. No, no comparable propaganda or anything like that there. Not saying it's not propaganda, but it's certainly not as ham-fisted as, say, Zhang Zemo's hero would be later. Now, both films, 
Dragon Inn and Hero are problematic in terms of how the wuxia genre is used in relation to propaganda, but they're used in different respects. Hero uses its propaganda to basically present the argument of unification of China or uh, under the Han at any cost, um, where the forces arrayed to assassinate the emperor, basically the assassin sent to kill the emperor chooses not to because he realizes he realizes unification is a better option. Um, which it's just a wee big bit problematic. Uh, considering the Chinese government's treatment of various ethnic minorities within China. And this is even before um, the current bugbear in the uh, uh, of the of what's been going on with the current Chinese premier. Dragon Inn, on the other hand, while um, looking his again, I can't I'm, the, I'm not in the best position to delve into this topic from a scope standpoint. This would definitely requires a lot, a much larger essay in um, someone who's much better read on these issues than I am. But I definitely see a bit of attack here with Dragon Inn of um, the... Um, of the flight from a corrupt central Chinese authority to safety elsewhere, though in this case not ex not explicitly stated to be Taiwan, just to just elsewhere. Um, but on the other hand, the family of the Yu's family is just merely depicted of fleeing for their lives from murder by the um, uh, by the officials of the Eastern Office and the corrupt. Um, eunuch secret police and in turn their control of the central government but they're not depicted as being true heirs to the state which is which was at the time and still is um, to a degree the stance of the Taiwanese government that or at least particularly at the time the stance of the Chinese government was that we're the official legitimate Chinese government not those guys over, not those assholes over there so it's less overt and in your face about it in terms of a clear oh boom here's the message sort of situation and that works in dragon inn's favor both films are very visually well shot um dragon inn doesn't do the same interesting stuff with narrative that you get from hero um but also on the other hand like To be frank, Hero is a work that exists in the wake of Dragon Inn and other wuxia films from creators like King Hu. And it is like it is definitely clear that it is a film that is reacting to like they're 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 they're, they're in dialogue with each other. I'll just put it that way. They're films that are in dialogue with each other. This is a influential film in the wuxia genre for a reason. Um and because I think in particular, King Hu uses terrain, uses landscape, and uses the uses Taiwan and the scenery that's available for him as a as a palette much like very effectively, and it uses it in a way which definitely feeds into later works. Use feeds into how Hero uses landscapes. Feeds into even before that, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon with Ang Lee use landscapes. Um, the difference being is that they are shooting in, they have access to mainland China, and the and the diversity of biomes and the diversity of landscapes that are available to them there. But even there, even still with Taiwan, it's definitely clear that King Hu is using the fact of this new location that he has and what makes it different from 
the scenery that gets used and to a certain degree somewhat overused in Hong Kong films and go Hong Kong's wuxia films and from the Shaw brothers and going, okay, there's a lot I can do here. Um, there's something there, there's camera places and locations we can film on all this stuff that you don't normally see in these kind of movies in particularly with what I was making back in Hong Kong. And it gives the film a sense of energy and life to its presentation. Not to say that Come Drink With Me was lacking it, any of those things, but more that this, that, that King Hugh is able to make, in terms of the visual presentation, much more of the wuxia film that he sees in his head from how I'm seeing this film done in com in contrast to Come Drink With Me. And we're going to get much more in depth with this later this month when we get to, I think, probably even the, what I consider King Hughes' opus. Um, like, biggest, one of his bigger works, and it's only one of his biggest epics um, in his career with a touch of Zen. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.